Um, all right, so here is my talk. I, today I'm talking about data science and how it is and should be intersectional. I'm going to try really hard to speak from my personal perspective, my personal experience of how I got here and what a project looks like for me and what intersectionality is and how it's relevant. So and, and, and. Right, and here is the first part. So I wanted to first talk about intersectionality and what it means. I know it's a term that we may have all heard a lot recently and it's become sort of a buzzword, but it is relevant and I, it's especially relevant because it was coined by a black woman. Um, it's relevant to me, I should say, and to many people in this room. Intersectionality was coined in 1989 by Kimberly Crenshaw in a paper for the University of Chicago Legal Forum. Its initial use was, it was intended to shine a light on the bias and erasure and violence that black women face at the intersection of sexism and racism. And so it's this idea that we cannot be our experiences cannot be explained or fully encompassed when we are only being allowed to exist with one of our identities because we don't exist as just, just the separate parts of who we are. We exist at the crux of that, at the intersection of all those every day. Um, and to, to give a quote from her paper, because the intersectional experience is greater than the sum of racism and sexism, any analysis that does not take intersectionality into account cannot sufficiently address the particular manner in which black women are subordinated. I think that this is important, especially the word analysis. I know in this context it's used in a legal sense, but it also applies to when you are doing data analysis and specifically for me, data science, which encompasses aspects of data analysis, that you cannot fully get the idea of the, especially with demographic data, the idea of what, the, what you're looking at and the factors if you're not considering the intersectional experiences of the people that you are considering, the people that you're researching, and whatever your final product is. You need to consider these intersections. Um, and it's relevant to the path of becoming a data scientist, being, bleh, becoming a data scientist, not a data science, I am not a concept, <laughs> and the work done by data scientists. All right, oops. So I want to talk about my path to becoming a data scientist because it is relevant to these intersections, and I'll get into some anecdotes as we get through this. Um, I only have like seven slides, so you're gonna have to like look at me a lot while I'm talking about things. Uh, so I started off my journey as a human, um, as a child, <laughs> being a mathlete, as we heard Rachel say, I loved math. Um, I still love math. I tried to be a teacher at some point, and I'm referring back to maybe five years old, my siblings were about three and two. Um, I was not a great teacher. I would get frustrated with them a lot, and my report cards were not something that you could write as an official teacher, you would be fired. Um, and as a poet and as a problem solver, growing up, I would put together these different sketches for different ideas and write together these different algorithms for solving problems that I either didn't know exist or I knew existed and I wanted to solve them in my community, but I thought that this meant something more towards engineering, something physical. I thought to create tangible change, I needed to create something physical. Um, and so I started off my college career as a civil engineer. Um, as you can see, I got a BA in math, so that did not hold. <laughs> I was a civil engineer for my first two years in college, and I definitely felt like I was being prepared to have a job, but I didn't feel like it was fostering a passion for creating innovative solutions, and that may have just been me not finding the passion in it, or it may have been part of the program, either way, it wasn't a great fit, and so I switched to math, primarily because the credit transferred, but also because I love math. Um, and so I finished up my degree, my BA in math, with an arts concentration um, in Spanish at UNO, and then I went on to become a youth development professional, uh, leading a local arm of a national pilot in quality STEM programming for underrepresented and underserved youth. And so we had a pilot in Omaha, a pilot in Dallas, and a pilot in Orange County, um, in Omaha, we were focused in North Omaha and South Omaha, bringing quality experiences to students that looked like me or looked like the classrooms that I grew up in. And actually, shout out to Carl, we went to middle school together, and now he's here involved in tech. Um, so I wanted to create these quality experiences because this is something that I was looking for, something that I needed, something that drove me to having a passion for creating change and seeing it happen for the people around me. Um, and this is my first taste of 
getting into what that looked like and what that felt like, but it still didn't feel quite right. It's like, okay, I'm doing youth development work and there's this emotional stamina that you need to have. And if you have severe social anxiety, being around kids all day does not always work. It did not work for me. Um, and so after crying in my car for a few weeks, I was like, I need to figure out what I need to do. And so I turned to my mom, as we do, and she said, Noni, you just go back to school. I've been telling you this for the past two years. And I'm like, I know, but I don't listen to you. And I was like, what do I need? A, what am I going to study? She's like, well, you already have your bachelor's in math. You could get your master's in math. I'm like, that is a great idea. Also, what else should I concentrate in? I lean on my mom a lot. Some of you may know her. Her name is Nancy Williams. She's a former tech professional, and now she has a nonprofit dealing with food and local sustainability. I see a little fist pumps. <laughs> For those of you that look up to a mentor, I just want you to know that I definitely see her as that too, and she treats me um, like in that professional relationship. So she gives me that tough advice. She says the hard things that I need to hear, and I cry a little bit, and then then we get it together. Um, so I decided to go into data science because it seemed like it would, sol it would cover the basis of what I wanted to do with analytics and solving problems and, again, affecting real change for people. My very first semester in grad school, I took a class called Deterministic Operations Research Models. And so this class deals with creating linear models um, to optimize whatever problem, whatever solution that you are looking for. It's fine, I'm telling a story. Maybe it'll wake back up. I can keep talking. Um, so that class was creating, creating those linear models. The project that I decided to do at the end of the semester involved taking the different constraints from that after school, not after school, out of school time program. And so the capacity for the partnering agencies, the capacity for the community in terms of number of youth, um, capacity of the classrooms, staff, budget, all of these things, considering all of these things, and running it through the model to see if I could optimize this, to see if we could meet our goals. And it turns out we couldn't, and I knew that no one had gone through that process to do that with the pilot program to see what was actually feasible for us all. Um, and so once I finished that paper, I, being the person that I am, I sent it to them. I didn't work for them anymore, but I was like, I want you to read this. I want you to see this, and I want you to know that these goals weren't feasible, but here are some things that we can do to reassess and make this a more effective program. Um, so that was my very first taste with data science of creating this tangible change for something in the community that I was passionate about. We're getting quality STEM programming, but we're making it so that we can actually meet our goals and so that it's not this haphazard thing that we're doing to kids in the community, but it's something that we're working smart about to get quality experiences so that we can have more people doing data science and making better decisions. Um, and so now, Part of social anxiety is that I forget to breathe, so I'm going to breathe a little bit. <laughs> and so now I am a manager of solutions and continuous improvement at United Way of the Midlands, and that's a lot of words to say that I solve problems and also I help manage um, the evaluation for continuous improvement for one of our education initiatives. Um, I work with Collective for Youth. If you're not familiar with that, it is a backbone agency for nine different agencies that have 30 plus after school sites uh, in the Omaha area. So we're working with out of school time youth development professionals. We're working with school data. We're working with their, um, their data from the program, so different programmatic data, and looking for different reasons to get stakeholders, funders to invest and see what the effect of what we're doing with the youth is, and, and, and I help manage the data system. So I pull reports, a lot of ETL, which is extracting the data, transforming the data, loading it back into lots of different sources. Um, and I want to say that my experience and what I'm going to be talking about data science specifically refers to nonprofit. If you can't tell, I've spent my entire life in nonprofit. My professional life is in nonprofit. What I know is nonprofit, so this is data science from the lens of a nonprofit agency. So according to UNO, data science is the art and science of transforming raw data into deliverable data products in order to help businesses or government agencies make informed decisions. And this is the definition from the school website, and this is their graphic where it includes, oh, that's embarrassing. Excuse me, I have a burp. I tried really hard to not be embarrassing when I came up here today, but this is me, you get authentic Noni. 
Um, so with data science, it involves a lot of these things. And I keep saying and, 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 because it's, it's never just these things. It involves more things, more people things, more technology. As we learn and grow with technology, we can apply more of that with the math and the statistics and the information science and the computer science. Um, so the next definition, a multi multidisciplinary field that employs techniques and theories from mathematics, statistics, information science, and computer science. And I want to say from a more academic lens, these are the kinds of things that we covered at UNO. I will say I finished my coursework last May. Just got to turn my project in. So I, in my heart, I feel like I'm done. I'm not. I'm basically done. <laughs> Thank you. My boss makes me take one day a week to work on my project. He's just tired of me working on, on, my, on my master's degree. So you get into data visualization. You get into using scientific methods, statistical modeling, statistical computing, data technology, data research, data consulting, real world applications. Um, these are different ways that you can go with data science. But it's also, I feel, when I think of it, I think of this as the toolkit for data science. And, and, and. So data science is also creating buy-in for change. And I say this, again, specifically from the lens of working for a nonprofit. When you're in nonprofits, you rarely have a huge data team. I'm in the analytics and performance department at United Way, and I am the data person. And then I have my boss, who's more of our project manager. And then I have a coworker who is, she leads our evaluation team. Uh, she's a dino, she's so impressive. Um, but rarely are there multiple data people on teams for nonprofits. And so creating this buy-in for change of the, in the, for evolving the technology that we use, involving the ways that we interact with data, um, and getting the senior management to realize that these are the kinds of projects, these are the kind of questions that we need to be ans answering and the kinds of solutions that we want to be putting forward. So, in my experience, creating buy-in for change includes some aspects of these steps. And again, this looks different for any problem. But it's understanding the business problem, of course. You want to know what question you're answering. What problem am I trying to solve? That's the, that's the key part of anything in data science is what am I trying to solve? And then establishing open lines of communication. You think with data science, you don't have to involve the people part or in technology. Um, it's easier to get away from the people part because maybe you, you spend eight hours a day staring at the computer and then the extra two hours communicating with people because in nonprofit, it's not just an eight hour day. Um, but you, it's easy to get away from this because you are doing, you're doing the work, but you also need to do the work of building up those relationships. It's such an important part. So establishing open lines of communication, especially with key stakeholders, and then building trust. Do I have a slide for, no, I don't have a slide for building trust because I took it out and I was like, I don't need a slide for that. So <laughs> building trust, I mean this in the, in the obvious sense, but also in the sense of building trust on three different levels. Building trust with the data. So getting people to, to understand that the data that you're using is relevant. Um, and this also involves, again, appreciating people's intersectional identities and experiences. So to create trust with the data, you need to understand that the data is what you should be looking at. And so the people that you have in the room creating these questions and looking at the data sources should also be people that know of or exist at the identities of what you're looking at because you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you're missing. If you don't know what you're missing, you don't know what's relevant if you don't have that experience. And so it's very easy to overlook things that you might not think of as important um, say as like a white man, but as a black woman, I'd say, oh, these factors are important. This variable is important. I see this a different way that, than you do. And then implementing relevant feedback. So again, still just keeping those lines of communication open so that people can buy in more. They feel like they're a part of the process. And then receiving the go ahead. So you have their approval. You're going on to create the product. Breathe. <laughs> so again, nonprofits, huge part of technology and data science in general is creating that buy-in for change. And it's not a fast process because it's nonprofit, but you got to stick with it. <laughs> All right. And so a typical project lifespan for me, it starts with building understanding of that intended outcome, finding 
whatever the business problem is, whatever the goal is, whatever the question is. And so it's these conversations with stakeholders. When I first started at United Way, my very first week I had seven meetings. It was five days, I had seven meetings. Like I got to work and they were like, all right, we're going, we're leaving for a meeting. And I was like, why are we having all of these conversations? Like, I, can I sit at my desk, please? Um, but I understand now, I understand the relevance, the importance of creating these relationships with stakeholders because again, you don't know what you don't know and being a part, being a data science, being data scientist, again, not a concept, a person, being a data scientist as a part of those conversations, you're getting more of an insight into where the intersections are, what is important, um, and then being able to have context to consult with people about what's relevant in the data, what, what you're seeing. And then examining existing deliverables, this is just a general, you don't want to recreate work. You're tech people, most of you are tech people, you understand. Um, because people come to you with questions, can I have X, Y, and Z? It's like, I could have sworn I sent that to you last month, but I will resend that email. Um, and then accessing the data, extraction from whatever data system. And as a nonprofit that works with after school systems, I have a really cool opportunity to work with OPS data. So I have an, a feed with set variables from OPS that I get every day, but I also have this really great relationship with being able to get requests, research requests from OPS and work on some really cool projects. We completed one this past year um, of looking at a whole host. We asked for a lot of things and they gave us all of the things and we were looking for it to see if there was any sort of difference that being in the after school program made for youth. Um, and we saw just based on all of our different variables, we have um, quality assessments from the actual programs, their program attendance, their school attendance, their MAP scores, their NISA scores, everything. Um, and looking at that, we saw that just being in after school programs, they were coming to school more, whether or not they were at the program, just knowing that they had that as an option, they were at school more. Um, so being able to access this kind of data and relevant community partners, the data from them, and again, that's why you go to the meetings with the stakeholders so you know who to ask. Um, and then the exploratory analysis. You see, I, my shoulders went up at this part. I love this part because you get to play around with really cool data visualizations. I use R a lot. It's something that we use in grad school. It's something that I use now just whenever I have a question, um, I could just like think about it and say, oh, this is probably what this looks like. But I'm like, no, let me throw it in R. I'll just, in the meeting, let me just pull it up for you. I love R for exploratory analysis. Um, getting these just basic visualizations, seeing which variables are having what effect on what other variables, pulling things together. And then after that is the important part of finding the context, which again is where this intersectionality is important. So keeping this in mind, but also involving people in these conversations that are relevant to the data that you're looking at. Um, and again, a quote from Kimberly Crenshaw. This is from an interview two years ago talking about this paper that she wrote in 1989. She said, intersectionality is a lens through which you can see where power comes and collides, where it interlocks and intersects. It's not simply that there's a race problem here, a gender problem here, a class or LG, LBGTQ problem here. Many times that framework erases what happens to people who are subject to all of these things. Um, so, oh, I lost my train of thought. So this again is why this step is here and why intersectionality is important especially looking at demographic data, or using data from people, knowing what their experiences are, knowing what their identities are. This is a relevant part into figuring out what your end product is going to look like and how it functions and just what you're putting out. You don't want to put out a message that is not congruent with the people that you're looking at or whatever type of data that you're looking at. And then stakeholder feedback. This is part of that building trust. You go back and you let them give input on what you've done so far, and then final delivery. So I want to talk about some Yule, some Yules, tools, some tools I use frequently. Um, R and R Shiny, how many people use R? Oh, I wanted to see more hands. <laughs> if you're not familiar with R, it's really great for processing data, it's really great for statistical analysis, um, it's really great for data visualizations, it's a bit of a steep learning curve, but it's if you like the idea of looking at your data, doing different um, modifications to it, transforming it, um, and getting some quick feedback on what you've done so far, R is a great tool. If you use Python, that's okay too. <laughs> I love Python. It's really robust for machine learning and 
different types of forecasting tools, and, and, and Python is really powerful. And I use that with data science. Using R and Python and SQL together makes for a really powerful transformation part of your ETL with data science. Um, SAP Business, Objects, ArcGIS, Tableau, Power BI, all of these things help make the, the data delivery part easier and it makes it more accessible for people who aren't as data inclined. But these are some things that I use on a day-to-day -day basis at a data, as a data scientist and nonprofit. So if you've ever thought about being a data scientist for a nonprofit and you're like, well, what would I be able to use Excel? All you gotta do is just strong arm them with all the things that you like. And they will, they will let you do it because you're the only one who knows how to do it. <laughs> um, all right, and so the end of this is just some resources um, sources and resources. Um, I will do something to get these out to you. If you would like to contact me, my email is noniwilliams at gmail.com because it's in there somewhere, but this is my name. It's just that at gmail.com. Um, and I wanted to follow this up with something that I forgot to say at the beginning because, again, anxiety. Um, but I wanted to talk about my experience in school and so I don't want this to come off as like, oh, this is just UNO. This isn't something that I've only experienced at UNO and I have siblings that have done technology at done tech, data science, data math at other schools and I've had similar experiences. But I wanna talk about one of my most recent ones. Um, I was taking an information theory class and so we were dealing with the abstract ideas, the theoretical ideas what happens with entropy specifically when you are compressing and decompressing data. So if you can imagine that as an abstract course, we we're writing a lot of proofs, um, and I had a professor in this class, there were, step back, there were three of us in this classroom, three graduate students and the professor, and he had this habit of going to the back of the classroom and sitting there while you go up and do your proof. And so as I put my chalk to the board, I'm starting to write out my proof every time, every time this whole semester, it's, no, 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 or don't start there, don't start there, until my proof on the board looked like his argument. And in this class, on my problem sets, on my tests, on my anything else that I turned in, essays, it was never less than an A. And so you can just imagine how invalidating that is to be at the front of the room trying to show your th thought process, this is how I think, this is how I process, and this being invalidated as a person in front of the room, not your words, not your ideas, but as a person in the front of the room, it creates this experience and it never seemed, it never seemed like it was done out of animosity, it just felt like because this, is, this was my last semester of coursework in grad school, this is something that I was familiar with. And so it never seemed like it was done out of animosity, this is just what it felt like the culture. And so if your thought process wasn't exactly the same or if you started somewhere differently, you are often, I was, as a black woman, um, usually the only black person, usually the only woman, or femme identifying person in the room, being invalidated or sighed at because you were taking up more space in the room. Um, and I've seen people drop out of the program because of experiences like that. And I think the reason that I stayed, I know the reason that I stayed is because Nancy Williams is my mother and from, <laughs> From elementary school, I have a vivid memory of being in fifth grade and a teacher had said something to me in a classroom and I was like, well that, I personally, I didn't feel like that validated who I was or how I thought um, because my process is different and I have always felt like that was valid so I'm strong, <laughs> I've got a strong ego. Um, but she always told us that you always have to be an advocate for yourself because you don't know who is going to stand up for you or who's gonna be there for you to help get your point across, to help fight for you in that room. So I don't say that to say you should be okay if this happens in the room, just be strong. You should be vocal about it, make sure that they're aware that this is happening, let them know and however respectful of a way as you deem is appropriate. Um, but to say that you shouldn't have to have someone who's impressing upon you to be an advocate for yourself to have, to have a good experience in these rooms. So if you are in school or if you are in these experiences and you see something like that happening, 
make sure that you speak up for the people in your room, people in the room, or ask them if it's okay for you to say something if they're not comfortable saying it. But also to be aware that sometimes for people like me to be in a place where I am now, it takes a strong woman telling, teaching me to be that strong woman and be an advocate for yourself. So I will say be an advocate for yourself, but also make sure that you are advocating for the people around you.